Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. I want to dive into a topic that I haven't discussed too much yet, but I think it's worth talking about. It's worth understanding how this fits into the bigger picture, and that is calculating acoustics, calculating treatment, calculating how much treatment you need and why we're not looking at that so much, why you don't see that so often when we're talking about treating home studios. But why is that? Why is it seemingly so hard to just go in and calculate the acoustics of your home studio and figure out what to do with your treatment, how much treatment you need and where to put it? Because surely that should be possible, right? I mean, it's physics, it's maths, some clever person out there will have figured out how the acoustics in a small room works and give us some tools to figure out how we can put that into practice. Well, it's not that simple, unfortunately. And in fact, in your typical home studio, your typical small room, it's almost impossible to calculate the acoustics to a point where it becomes useful to us. And that's what I want to get into in this video. I want to show you how you calculate the acoustics in a room and then where it starts breaking apart and what we can do, what we should do instead. Let's jump in. So a big disclaimer first, and I've mentioned it quite a few times, this advice or what I'm about to show you is only relevant in really small rooms. Calculating acoustics and the kind of physics and the maths behind it works just fine in big big spaces. And that's how acousticians deal with your typical kind of concert hall or stadium or sports arena, or whatever. But we're talking about home studios, we're talking about small rooms, and all of that stuff just kind of starts breaking apart. Okay, so let's get down to basics. How do you calculate the acoustics? Well, in its most fundamental form, it is literally just a function of the surface area in that room and the absorption of that surface area. Yeah, and that will give you a certain reverb time, an RT60, a time it takes the sound to decay by 60 decibels, as was kind of invented by this guy called Sabine, or this, there was this guy called Sabine who came up with this, this formula. So we got it right here. It is literally just the RT60, the reverb time for, for the sound to decay by 60 decibels is calculated by multiplying the volume of the room in square feet, or squ in this case, square meters, by 0 0.161. And then you divide that whole number by the total amount of absorption in the room. And the absorption itself is a function of the surface area and the associated absorption coefficient of that surface area. Yeah. So think about it in terms of, as an, as an example, a concrete bunker. Yes, fully reflective walls. It's just a rectangular space, all concrete, and it's got a certain surface area. It's got a certain volume dependent on the, the size of the space. And at the moment, the surface area, all the surface area is basically has an absorption coefficient of zero. Yeah? So this number is very, very small. And that means we end up with some kind of reverb time that is pretty large. So as you start adding in absorptive material, or rather the absorption coefficient of that surface area rises yeah, by, for example, putting porous absorption on the wall, insulation material or acoustic foam, this number actually starts rising that total amount of absorption in this formula, and thus the RT60 goes down, right? That's pretty much it. Yeah, at its most fundamental, that's how you calculate the acoustics in the space. So when you put that into a practice, when you actually want to use these formulas, you kind of have to split this up into the different uh, parts of the spectrum. Obviously, you kind of want to be more, more detailed, more accurate in terms of how this behaves across the entire spectrum, because obviously you could do this with one number, but it wouldn't tell you very much. And there's a lovely calculator on the net that we can use to do this in practice. 
and that is uh, on the same site of the AMROC room mode calculator that uh, you've seen me use before and we'll look at again in a second. What we can do here is just start with an RT60, some number that we either measure or calculated of the empty space, right? We, we also set a, a target that we want to reach and then we put absorption in the room. So we just cover surface area with a certain absorption coefficient and then it spits out where we land with our RT60, whether we kind of land in the target bracket. Yeah, so let's just do this in practice. This is all metric, but let's just go with a really simple space. So six meters long, that's about 19, 20 feet, um, four meters wide. So that's like 13 feet wide. And then kind of your typical ceiling of three meters, which is about 10 feet, okay? And we could use this to calculate the RT60 in the empty space. Unfortunately, this isn't <laughs> implemented yet here. So we just have to draw one in and I'm just gonna kind of do whatever I think kind of is typical for a small room. So kind of something like that, yeah? So this is our starting point. And now we can specify a certain target RT60 that we want to land in. So there are certain standards or um, certain criteria that we can pick to set a target. I'm just gonna go with the EBU listening room and then we move on to the absorber. So we're just gonna create one. This is a very simple type of model, acoustic model that we can use to calculate the, the our absorber. And so all we're gonna do is just say how much, uh, how, how deep we want this thing to be. And then we, we kind of pick a, an associated flow resistivity. So I'm just gonna go for like 30 centimeters about a foot. Yeah, we're gonna mess with this. Uh, flow resistivity just to kind of optimize where we land. So we need something a very low flow resistivity in order to maximize this and we end up with kind of this, uh, this absorption coefficient, right? So we've got frequency on the bottom, we've got our absorption coefficient on the vertical scale here. And so this now kind of specifies the absorber that we're using, which is 30 centimeters deep with a flow resistivity of three kilopascal seconds by meter squared. And I press save. And so now we've got this absorber created. At the moment, there's one square meter of it in the room. And now if we go to this final tab, it shows us our target curve. Yeah, so that's the bracket. These two, these two bars show us the bracket that we wanna land in in order to meet the EBU listening room criteria. And with one square meter of this particular absorber in the space, we go from the blue line to the red line. So the fun thing is that we can now just go in and, and say how much surface area we're actually adding to the room of this particular absorb absorber, if you will, this, this surface. Um, and we can watch as the orange line drops down as we're adding more and more surface at this absorption coefficient to the room, yeah? So let me just kind of just walk through this. Here's 20 square meters. Let's jump to 30 square meters. Yeah, and now we can see even with the, the the green part showing us where we're within where we are within the bracket that we want to reach. So this is how you would put these formulas into practice and how acousticians the world over calculate how much absorption they need when they're treating concert halls and bigger spaces of that size. But here's the problem. All this assumes that the reverb time basically consists of a fully diffuse sound field in the room. So for any point in space, if you were to measure the sound field, we'd expect sound to arrive at that point with equal energy and equal probability from all directions. Yeah, a perfectly sound, a diffuse sound field, no matter where you are in the room. And of course, in practice, and in, partic in particular in a small room, that's pretty much not the case especially in the low end, but even in the, the mids and highs, we're not really looking at a perfectly diffuse sound field. Yeah, but let's just start with the lows. And that's where the AMROC room mode calculator once again comes in. Yeah, so we enter the same dimensions for our space, just as an example. And what it now tells us beyond where our standing waves sit at what frequency they sit, it also tells us something relating to these formulas that we just looked at that calculate how much absorption you need. So it tells us how much, how much volume there is in this room. It tells us the surface area of the room. We can then select a certain target 
RT60. Let's just call it 0.3 seconds, which is kind of a guideline that that's that's out there for for your typical studio. And so now what it tells us is this number right here, the Schröder frequency, the Schroeder frequency. Yeah, and basically that is a, a, a an artificial threshold that we can calculate and at which beyond which or below which we assume that the room's acoustics are dominated by standing waves or room modes. Yeah, so these guys up here. Yeah, so basically up to about 129 hertz, up to about right about there, we can sort of set an artificial threshold and say everything below that is dominated by standing waves and above that is dominated by reflections. This is a purely artificial threshold, as I've mentioned a few times now. Yeah, so there is a much smoother transition, and I wouldn't put too much emphasis on the exact value of the Schroeder frequency. This, the, the, there's a kind of a range in the middle there around that number where you get a, a mix and match of reflections and room modes, and sometimes it, it can be really difficult to kind of understand what is what. Yeah, they kind of just both occupy that space. So the point, though, is, is that below a certain frequency in a room, we can definitely say that the, the acoustics is dominated by standing waves. Very roughly, let's just call it 100 hertz. Yeah, And that means any of the calculations that we did to figure out how the room behaves with absorption or a certain amount of surface area covered by absorption, all that is just basically wrong. Yeah, because we are not looking at a diffuse sound field, we're looking at a room mode pattern. And so none of this actually works out. Yeah, so in this in this diagram, that's, that's basically right about there. Everything below that we can basically ignore in terms of this calculation. Yeah, obviously that's the part that's most interesting to us. But it doesn't stop there. Even the upper part of the spectrum doesn't really adhere to these calculations all too well. And the reason is that even in the kind of reflection area of the spectrum, we don't have a diffuse sound field. Think about the, the concrete bunker again, or just an untreated space. What you get is a lot of specular reflections. So the difference between a kind of a specular and a diffuse reflection is one is kind of where things just kind of spread out in all directions. And the other one is more like a beam of light. Yeah, so think a laser pointer through a mirror or something, yeah, or playing pool, yeah? playing billiards. And that, of course, means two things. First of all, the original calculation, if you calculated the, the, um, the reverb time in the empty space, then sure, that, that formula spits out a certain number, but that's not actually what you're going to get exactly in your actual room. You're not going to get a sound field that actually follows the same principles as the model does. And you can't really measure the RT60 all that accurately either. Because once again, in the lowest frequencies, we're talking about standing waves. So you, it's it, the measurements are going to spit out a certain RT60. But it's not actually RT60. It measures the decay in the lowest frequencies. And then in the higher frequencies, we it once again spits out a certain number but that's not really RT60. Yeah, so you can plug these numbers into a calculator like this, but it's not actually going to represent what is happening in the room all too well. And here's a fun fact to drive this point even further. Think about this. When we're talking about our, where we're imagining our concrete bunker again, in the empty space, there's a bunch of reflections, yeah, specular, but there's a ton going on. So let's imagine we treat this space and we put a bunch of absorption on all the surfaces. So now we stop those reflections from happening, even the spe specular ones. So you end up with a decay in the room that is even less diffuse, yeah? So in a, in a way, the more you treat the room, the less accurate your reverb time measurements measurements are going to get. So then how do you figure out how much treatment you need in a home studio? Well, the unfortunate and honest answer is that it comes down to experience. And that's why I keep showing you examples of spaces in on my YouTube channel. And I focus really heavily on using examples in my online courses as well to help you kind of jumpstart the experience game.
But to help you right now, let me give you kind of two ideas, two benchmarks, two numbers that you can use to orient yourself in this question of how much treatment you need in a home studio. So first of all, this calculator obviously tells you how much surface area you're covering to get this result. And as I mentioned, this isn't accurate at all for a small room, but it gives you a very vague idea of how much area, how much treatment is actually covered by panels, let's say, just as a very, very rough starting point. Yeah? And if we look at how much surface area this room actually has, about 110 square meters, so that means about 30 square meters is about a third of the surface area covered with absorption yeah, as a starting point, just to give you uh, an idea of how much treatment it takes to actually move the needle in terms of the sound in the room. In a similar way, actually, the room mode calculator also tells you how much uh, absorption you need because you can enter, again, certain kind of target values. I'm going to use the EBU listening room here. And so now it tells you that, according to Sabine, you need about 53 square meters with an average absorption coefficient of 0.5 in order to get into the target area, that, that kind of target zone that is shown right here. For a lot of you, you might be thinking, wow, that's a lot. And in a way, that's what I'm trying to convey with this video. It's often underestimated just how much treatment you need to actually do something good in your room, to do something useful and get proper benefits for your working environment, it takes a lot more than you would think. So just kind of putting one or two panels in the room, although it changes how the room sounds, it doesn't really have a massive impact on how, you're, how you work or your ability to work. Yeah, it does take quite a bit more. I wanna desensitize you in a way to these numbers in order for you to actually get what you want. And on your way to that goal, on your path to that goal, my personal experience is that you need to think in kind of minimum sets of three typical absorption panels that you can buy or you can build yourself, yeah? So if you wanna get a noticeable, a useful difference in your studio, always work in kind of steps of three panels at the time or use that as a kind of a benchmark to think about the process. So if you're adding acoustics, acoustic panels to your room, do at, add at least three <laughs> or six or nine or 12 and so on in order to kind of move through this process of treating to the room and hopefully get to something like this where you're covering a third, maybe even a half of the surface area with absorption. Okay then, so to wrap this up, let me leave you with this. I hope that it, this showed you that you shouldn't obsess about calculating your acoustics. Yeah. Sometimes that seems like that must be the right way to do it. And in theory, it would be, except that it's not really possible yet. There are ways to do this. They're just very, very, very difficult. And they're not accessible to us, yeah, as kind of our, as, as us home studio people trying to treat our rooms DIY style. So do go in and use these calculators that I showed you. I'm going to link them in the description as well. Use them to experiment, use them to play around. It's a lot of fun. It will give you an insight very generally how things work, but don't think that you need to use this right down to the last detail before you can actually get started with your treatment. In fact, I recommend the opposite. Get started with treatment as soon as you can because it is about gaining experience, because it is about understanding and getting a feel for how much you really need, what you need to do to get a certain effect. And to help you with that, I've also created a home studio treatment framework that you can download at the link in the description. It is my five steps to systematically treat a room and get it to translate. This is for you to keep the bigger picture, for you to understand what steps to take at what stage in the process of treating your room. And obviously measurements are in there as well when to use them and how to use them so that they actually add to your understanding of the room and not keep you turning in circles and kind of chasing false promises of how you need to go about treating your room. Yeah? So again, that's my home studio treatment framework at the link in the description, completely for free, my five steps to systematically treating a room and getting it to translate. And with that, let me leave you with a thanks for watching. 
Let's get back to learning to trust our ears and having fun making music in the studio. I'll see you in the next video.